from the shores of beautiful Lake Coeur d'Alene in the heart of North Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discuss their topics on our forum. The North Idaho College Public Forum. With your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. I am most pleased to welcome you back to our series that we're doing called Journey Through America's 20th Century. On today's program, I am so proud to have a very close friend of mine here and a person that's so highly qualified to address today's topic, and that is as we look through America's 20th century, it is very important to recognize contributions of Native Americans in this 20th century that we've just uh, passed through. Uh, our guest is Raymond Reyes. He is the Associate Vice President for Diversity at Gonzaga University. Our guest holds a baccalaureate degree in psychology from Eastern Washington University, and he holds a master's degree in public administration from the City University of New York, and he is near completion of his doctor's program and degree. Raymond, it's such a pleasure to have you. We've had you here before on the program, and uh, you articulate with great power and energy uh, all these issues, and thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you. And as always, I'm so pleased to have our two regular panelists, uh, Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho, and next to her is Steve Schenck, who is the Vice President of College Relations and Development at Federal College, and we'll invite Janelle to commence the questioning of Raymond Reyes. Raymond, uh, the century lasted, of course, from around 1900 to 2000, and the life was quite different for Native Americans in 1900. What are some of the significant events that occurred during this last century? If you look at uh, the footprints from the 1900 all the way to this past year, what you see is entree to a new century, the 20th century from the 19th, with a group of people that, for all intents and purposes, were survivors of the American Holocaust. Let's not forget that there was indeed that occurrence on this continent. In coming into that century, one of the first things that I think is significant is uh, 24 years into the new century, the government declared U.S. citizenship for the Native people, which is, you know, you don't know whether it's poetic justice. You don't know whether it's a, it's a cosmic joke. You know, but in any event, you know that's that was the gateway. That was the threshold, and 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 then shortly after that, <clears throat> and excuse me, in 1934 was the Indian Reorganization Act, which began planting the seeds for self-determination and, and sovereignty, and began um, legitimating uh, the, the the reservation system as a as a separate entity, and really looking at at uh, tribal treaties as, as indeed treaties between sovereign nations the way the government would have it with Mexico or Canada or Israel or any other country. Um, and then after that, you, you see um, all kinds of th interesting things happening from the 19th century federal policy of, in essence, extermination to accommodation. And in 1952, you had the uh, Indian Reorganization Act where um, it was thought at the time that you could socially engineer the acculturation process of Indian people by removing them from reservations, putting them in, in urban areas, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Detroit, all over the United States, New York, and uh, give them jobs, you know, education, et cetera, so, quote, they succeed and be mainstreamed. So that was a speed bump in my assessment between earlier in the century where you acknowledge someone's citizenship validating that with the sense of you are different than any other ethnic community in the United States because you have treaties and Hispanics and black people and Afro-American people and, and Asian Americans do not have that kind of trust relationships with the, with the federal government. So that, that in 52, that was kind of a setback. And then um, you saw through the 60s, Indian people, in a sense, and I don't think people know this, taking more of a, a leadership role in some of the civil rights movements and there was a watershed period between 1969 and 1978 where a lot of Indian legislation was passed, Indian Education Act of 72, Indian Health Improvement Act, Indian Self-Determination Act. There was, a, there was a, just a, an abundant number of pieces of legislation that really benefited uh, Indian communities. And then, uh, as I said earlier today in my speech, it's ironic that in 1988, the government passed a piece of legislation called the, the Native American Indian Religious Freedom Act. So here's a country that was founded on religious freedom, the flight from the old world to the new world for religious freedom, and yet it took three-fourths of the time through the 20th century to, to acknowledge that American Indian people had religious freedom. And uh, so anyway, it, it was a, 
very, very uh, challenging century in terms of those kind of footprints. And you can see as I'm speaking, I'm talking about legislation, mm -hmm. which is this interesting relationship in terms of wardship or this parent-child relationship between the federal government and Indian people. But yet through the process of the 20th century, as we closed it, it's at being at par and equal partners in that relationship as the government would be with any sovereign entity. Steve Chin. I mean, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, as an educator, um, would you be willing to give us your opinion of the grade you'd assign to our school systems, both uh, uh, public schools and, uh, and uh, higher education, for the job they do in, in uh, teaching students about uh, minority contributions uh, in general, Native American contributions in particular? What kind of job are we doing in teaching history in, in, from that perspective? Well, I don't mean to be a petty tyrant or a negative wizard, but I, poorly, very poorly. Um, I, F, I, poorly? Well. Real close to it? Uh, omission. I mean, I guess there, there are sins of omission, not sins of commission. Mm -hmm. um, this sounds like cycle babble, but you don't know what you don't know. And I, don't, I, I believe that there are teachers that have been socialized in our schools of education, in college and universities, that teach in accordance with how they were taught. And so the content isn't there. So there's that piece is um, the, the voices and the stories and the perspectives aren't there. Uh, the other piece is how you teach. Now, that's a whole other pedagogical question in terms of how you teach becomes what you teach. But certainly going back to curriculum and content, uh, yeah, a failing grade because of omission. And here again, it's, it's, uh, it's not knowing the story because uh, they were never told. And I, you know, you and I and everyone here knows that schools are socialization factories. I mean, that's where uh, values are learned and confirmed. And uh, there's one perspective that has been dominant. And I'm not saying it's either or thinking. I think that we get to a place now as we enter this century where it needs to be and both and be more inclusive. And, and I think that there's a direct link between that, multiple perspectives, and intellectual development. I think it just makes good sense from problem solving, higher order thinking skills that you, give, you grant students different perspectives in terms of the discernment process to be able to use the power of reason and logic to problem solve and critically think. Well, you've touched on exactly where I wanted to go with this line of questioning, and uh, we talked about it either before the show or during the show with another guest uh, as part of this series. If we do nothing in our schools, and I agree with you, it's not, it's, I don't think it's intentional, uh, but I think the omission is very, very real. If we do nothing in our schools to um, make the majority population understand what the contributions have been of Native Americans and Hispanic Americans and African Americans, if we either ignore them or ignore some of the things that our society has done to them, and there's a very real omission mm -hmm. in the press and in, in history of those things as well, there's no context to understand right. the struggle for human rights or for human dignity or for equality in our society. And that's, do you share that concern? Uh, I, do you think it's real? Yes, I do. I, you've heard, perhaps I've said this before, that Carl Rogers was fond of saying that what you forget you always are, what you remember you can change. And I think that uh, in terms of education as an intergenerational transmission of knowledge held, that there's an important piece there, and that's history and the role of history to the here and now. And, you know, a couple of things come to mind as you ask the question or frame the query. People need to understand the role of history in the here and now, that it isn't about white guilt, blame, victimization. Mm -hmm. Why is it important for me to know and have that sense of history? So you have to use you know, some sort of logic or argumentation to be able to present that case and say, this is why. And then the second piece is, what do I do about it once I have that insight? What does it mean to me personally? And then also at an institutional level, what does that mean? But uh, you're precisely right. And then beyond the contributions, I mean, that's kind of a, a superficial, but it's a beginning point. But it's a superficial understanding of, of what our collective story has been in this country. Another area is not only learning about another ethnic community, but learning from. So then the nature of knowledge has a mutual relationship. It's not this that the alpha and the omega and the centrality of the discernment is the uh, Euro-American perspective and everything else is compare contrast to, but that the, the white perspective is in the circle and there, it, in the middle is the achievement of common ground. So there's not any one paradigm or model of thought that is dominant over the other as a frame of reference to then analyze or critically assess the merit contribution. The word contribution denotes contributing to what? 
is is it is it public space that everybody can benefit or contribute to you know and so I think that contributions is the beginning and that's that talks about uh, about learning about but also learning from and that's what I tried to talk about earlier today was uh, at that level I think that's a deeper level of, of uh, appreciation and understanding if I could just make one quick final comment I, 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 I couldn't agree more with everything you're saying I, I why should we be surprised that, that the majority of white Americans may look at uh, Native Americans, African Americans, and, the, and their struggle for equality and say, what's the big deal? Haven't we already taken care of all this? If they don't know, for instance, that there's a concerted effort, was a concerted effort, to, to uh, suppress the use of, of Native American tongues, to, to wipe out the history, why are they going to have any sympathy for the fact that Native Americans want that culture back? And I don't think we share that information, so we don't create the understanding. Well, I would want to believe, being uh, an idealist, that the motive comes from a place of love and compassion and not a place of fear. But if we have the psychology of the Neanderthal man, and to say that if I had to give some compelling reason why one would even care, it would be the fear and threat of history repeating itself, and that if it happened to me, it can happen to you. I, w I don't want to stay there. I want to believe that people uh, are about compassion, common passion, and passion, common passion, two pieces to that, forgiveness, reconciliation, mm -hmm. and love, and not fear-based reaction to, why well, better listen to history because it might repeat itself, and they come knocking on the door, they might be coming for me. You know, you've heard that story. Yes. But, uh, you know, I, I agree. I think that um, there's got to be more of an intrinsic motivation to want to do that. Why lately I've been working with a lot of faith communities. I think there's, you know, theology. We have a man up north here that uses the Bible to justify racism. I think that we also need to use that same theology to get uh, Christians to start walking their talk and living their faith. And as the Jesuits often frame it, faith that makes justice, faith that leads you and compels you to, ju to do justice. Why should you care very quickly? Um, Eric Law talks about justice being a redistribution of power and privilege. And I think that uh, most people that have had power and privilege take it for granted and do not understand that that's what the big deal is. It hasn't been an even playing field. And what we're trying to do is deal with the echo effect between 1787 when the Founding Fathers said, we the people. In 1787, who was we and the we the people? They were white, they were male, they owned slaves, they owned land, they were the elitists, they were wealthy, blah, you know, on and down the line. But this is the powerful thing. In 1787, these white males who owned slaves, who had the land, who had all the power, the elitist, sexist, racist, if you want to use contemporary labels to apply to those situations, which I don't want to get into revisionist history, but that was it. They had the kind of leadership and vision to deal about to deal with the, the ideal, and the ideal being life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So they, you know, and people say, well, Raymond, they were really talking about women and, and you people. Well, the vision was malleable and flexible enough that you had the kind of leadership that was transcendent to the current condition to weave this ideal of the American dream, here again, based on the love for freedom. And, and I think that's powerful. You know, but to understand that in that journey from 1787 until now, and what the 20th century represented was a quickening, certainly a quickening. I mean, when you think about it, um, Kills Devil Hill, Kitty Hawk, Simon Newcomb, a mathematician, said that flying was un impossible. And what did the Wright brothers do? They flew. Look at where we came from. And then very quickly after that, <clears throat> Chuck Yeager and, and, uh, and uh, Neil Armstrong, you just go on and on, you see what happened for, in a very, very short period of time. So the 20th century was like microwaving social change. We were on a slow <laughs> burn, you know, the 16th, 17th, 18th. I mean, the acceleration occurred, you know, when first contact, or, uh, you know, 1492, you know, the momentous time, first contact. But, I mean, certainly you can begin seeing the quickening. And we were on a slow burn. You know, the pilot light was just kind of you know, barely being, you know, another log in the fire. We hit the 20th century, man. Somebody put us in a microwave. Transportation, medicine. I mean, think about it. I mean, incredible. Thanks. And the Indian people were riding that wave along with you all. Thanks. One of the things that you were so good at today and when you presented before our audience that was obviously most enthusiastic for your presentation, you talked about the contribution of Native Americans and American Indian uh, communities as to what is it to be human. Yeah. And uh, and you asked that wonderful question to everyone, and uh, the Native American community has something very powerful to say. Would you share with our viewers the, 
Well, you know, I, so the, the process is the product. And as much as I'm a talking head and I've you know, prepared for many speeches and written articles and done all this, um, this one was a tough one because one would want to be seduced by the typical response to the query, Native American contributions to 20th century America. And immediately, there's a lot. I mean, there's several yeah. scholars that have written in the venue and, and you know, made the case that Indian people have contributed in the area of medicine, agriculture, food, architecture, law, government, you can just on down the road. And but a huge the, amount, as you said, on the food, the different kind of foods. Oh, the different and, foods, uh, even chocolate. I mean, and chilies and, and raspberries and strawberries and corn and pole, uh, pole beans and, and, and on and on. I mean, just you got to remember the old world, pre, prior contact, first contact, was a dying world. It was, there was starvation because of, of famine, and there was uh, great disease. So prior to Christopher Columbus, I don't know what doing that, the, the old world was dying. When they came here, I mean, the Indian people had sophisticated systems of, of government. I mean, Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Paine learned about you know, the executive, judicial, and, and legislative branch of government from the Iroquois League of Nations. And, 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 and so, yes, I mean, there, I mean, you can go on. So anyway, my point was I could spend a whole hour just talking about that and getting uh, people perspective on what they didn't get in their K-12 experience from their social studies or literature uh, teachers. But what I decided was what really was the contribution in the 20th century? What was really modeled? And going back to what I said earlier, began the, con the, the, the century as, Amer as, a, as survivors of the American Holocaust which then, the, the subtext of that is the notion of human resiliency and looking at some of the, the, the art of, what are some of the features of, of human resiliency. And certainly there's this uh, infinite ability to do the flight of the phoenix and come out of the ashes. And I think Indian people have repeatedly done that. You know? And uh, so I talked about that their main contribution in my assessment was answering the question, what does it mean to be human? and talked about uh, you know, not only the relationship to the earth and seeing the earth as uh, an abundant place uh, that required interdependent cooperation as opposed to a place of scarcity that demanded um, fear-based competition. And not to demonize the, the American model of capitalism and democracy, but certainly Indian people modeled a certain uh, way of looking at creation, and as the Jesuits call um, seeing the active presence of God in all things. And I think because of that, and certainly this was a, a originally designed as a Christian state. If you look at you know, Jamestown, you look at the city on the hill and some of those earlier pieces in 1620, this was a, a country that wanted to be founded as a Christian state. So central to its discernment would be faith and relationship to God. I think what does it mean to be human is a spiritual question. And what I talked about was the need to say, now is the time in the 21st century to do the harmonic convergence, to do the creative synthesis of taking the best of what Euro-American has been about for the last 300 years, worshiping at the altar of reason and logic. And believe me, I like what science provides for me. I like the warm shower that I had this morning. I like indoor plumbing. I mean, I like my car. I mean, I like, you know, sorry, dinosaurs, it's true. But I, you know, but I, I like, but see, there's the, there's the good things. And, and, and then also there's good things that from Indian country too. So I think it's a time now to think about and both and bringing the best of both worlds together for the benefit of the common good. And that's what I meant about I think we're losing our sense of humanity, whatever that means. For, you know, and it's transcendent to theological bent. But when you have, and I mentioned this in brief, when you have children killing children, when you have gangs, when you have these gang bangers, you, you, you have the symptomology of, of, a, of a generation who are by nature existential philosophers asking the principal questions, what is the purpose of life, who am I? Those are features of resiliency. When you look at resiliency, I talked about the sense of purpose, the sense of belongingness, community, the sense of hope, uniqueness, sense of power or self-efficacy. These are things that in tribal life were exemplified. And, and, and that's what I meant by the, the, the gift to the 20th century was this resiliency that tribal people appear to have that despite the, the attempt at extermination, despite all the things that have occurred, there's this brilliance of impeccable immortality that persists. And I think it has to do with the, the features inherent in the culture, the ceremonial practices, the songs, the dances, the sense of community. And from that come these other things that are answered in terms of who am I, what is the purpose of life. 
and I, it sounds a bit you know esoteric and philosophical, but if you talk to kids, and I've worked with kids in jails and worked with juvenile delinquents at times, I mean, they are asking those questions. And if we do not give them rites of passage, we don't give them some symbolic life, and symbols are a psychological mechanism to transform energy. If we don't give them that, they will find other ways to do that. Ritualized behavior, shooting dope, gang banging. I mean, they'll find ways. Violence is a mood altering substance. And, and, and so is ceremonial practice, and so is God. God is a mood altering substance too. I mean, I don't mean that in a, in a, in a profane way, but it is. It's transformative, because why would it's transformation? Transformation is the interaction between the human being and technical systems. And uh, I think that uh, this, this, cent this past century has taught us that that's what we need. We have, you know, we have a, a, a leader at the highest office in this land, you know, role modeling lying. I mean, where, let's go back to the basics, go back to the fundamentals. And that's what I meant by answering the questions. The, the answer to the question, what does it mean to be human? is the greatest contribution that Native America has given people. Because I think they've modeled that. They haven't talked about it. They've modeled it. Their journey through the century has been a case study of resiliency. Thank you very much. Danielle Burke. Well, I'm, I'm torn between asking two questions. Uh, one is to ask you if there are other contributions that you want to speak about that Native Americans have made. And, and the second question is with regard to the sense of community it seems to me that Native Americans have a very good idea of their sense of community. So if you would either choose one or the other or perhaps meld them together, because the sense of community, it seems to me, the whole Indian community pulls right. together. I think they're both linked. Um, the the uh, contribution question, and I'll, I'll just emphasize it again, uh, Thomas Berry talked about the universe being composed of subjects and not objects. You have communication with and relationship with subjects. You exploit and use objects. And I think that Indian people saw its first mother, the Earth Mother. And I don't mean the wax, and I said earlier, Indian people as being echo saints. No. My point is, there was a, a foundational perspective about what the human being was and is in relationship to creation and to the environment. And it was environment or Mother Earth as subject, not object. On the other hand, Euro-Americans came here using their science and powers of region and logic and technology to, you know, go out and manipulate the world to the contour to fit your needs, which is great. I mean, in some sense, it is good. In some sense, there are losers because there's an objectification of the earth. So contributions, I would say that Indian people, in addition to answering the question, what does it mean to be human, also contributed a model of thinking, a way of being, a way of knowing a way of a, a worldview, a model to look at life. So that, I think that's a powerful, taken for granted, um, romanticized part of the contribution. With respect to community, I think that it is inherent in the language and also in kinship. I think that when you look at language, when we talk about grandmother moon and mother earth and grandfather sun, I mean, look at, look at the kinship language right there. It's, it's inherent in, in the very language. Um, the importance of family was, was integral to the lifestyle in the worldview. And so th there, was no, there was no distinction. And even today, I mean, it's very, very strong. As much as you know, the boarding school experience and extracting kids when they were six years old and they wouldn't go home until they were 18, and you know, th that history, that part of history is an ugly, bleak part of history. Still, there was that deep tie. And I think it was a spiritual tie. I mean, it was th down deep inside. It was, it was spiritual, not religion. You know, I, I recently read somewhere that, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you go to church, that means you're Christian. If you drive your car, if you drive in a garage, does that make you a car? You yeah. know, and, and so, no, it's not about religion. It's, it's a deeper uh, sense of, of spirituality. And I think that in common unity, community, common unity, the common unity was uh, understanding um, that there was a purpose of life and that you communicate with God and that it's more not about altruism, it's about, it's not narcissism and self-absorbed kind of existence, but that knowing self plus what can I contribute to the common good. So there was more of a con co contributory ethic, as Father Spitzer would say, and less of a comparative ethic. Um, and so there, the only quest was to know self and know your gifts and purpose for, for, ma for manifesting in a greater sense the greater glory of God and giving back to the circle. So there was always this kind of spiritual uh, dimension 
to the ethos that became the unifying principle for this thing called common unity or commu co community. Raymond, we don't have a lot of time left, but I really enjoyed the metaphor um, from your earlier response about the low burn and, and the microwave. And we are supposed to be talking about the 20th century, but maybe Tony will forgive me for posing one question about the 21st. Are you hopeful? Are we still going to be in the microwave uh, in the 21st century, or are things slowing down for Native American peoples in a negative way in terms of, uh, of achieving that community you talked about? I, I think things are not slowing down, but I think that what advantage that we have now is that we're learning about and from Indian people um, in the area of psychology for thousands of years before Freud and, and Carl Jung and, and Rogers or, or Fritz Perls. You know, Indian people knew about the importance of dreams. They knew about narrative expression or storytelling or, or latent language processes that you do in client therapist relationships. Um, you know, they knew about plants and herbs in terms of medicinal intervention for mental health. Um, so what I'm, what I'm saying is, <clears throat> I think the microwave is going to continue. I think that we're going to have an acceleration and things are going to quicken. I, I will say you haven't seen anything yet, okay? So put fast in your seat belt, you know. Um, the, that's, that's good news. The good news is, on top of that, is that we're learning to slow down inside. And what I mean by that is, like, if we're, we're going to be drawn to go deeper. Um, example is, recently I talked about uh, to someone that uh, when, you, when these deep sea divers go down and they come up too quickly, they get the bends. And as we accelerate and go down, I mean, become more authentic and more real. If we don't uh, acclimate, and this is my point, if we do not acclimate to the quickening, we will get spiritual bends. So what you learn from Indian people is the power of reflection, slowing it down, being prayerful, being contemplative. On that no. note, I have to bring the poem to conclusion. We're just out of time. <laughs> Raymond, we just have to have you back <laughs> several more times. It just it flies by when you're it here. It does, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Thank <laughs> really? you so much. It's, it was wonderful to see you and to have you here on our program and to hear your words of wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Raymond Reyes, who is the Associate Vice President of Diversity at Gonzaga University. We're continuing our journey through America's 20th century, and today our subject was dealing with the great contributions of Native Americans to America's 20th century. Uh, next week we shall move to yet another issue in America's 20th century. As I indicated, this series is going to go for a number of weeks, and we are taking advantage of the people who have been with us at our campus during this symposium on this journey that we have just identified. Uh, please do join us. And until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum is the longest running public television show of its type in North America and is seen in seven states and two Canadian provinces. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational community outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another new edition of North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.